Well, folks, hello and welcome to another fantastic episode of RFRX. Now, this one is going to be a tough one, but it's still going to be fantastic. My name is Eric Wells, and I am the support group director for Recovering from Religion. And with me is my good friend and co-host for today, Sasha D'Souza, and he is the regional support group director for the Australia area. You like how I kind of did that, Sasha? Very good. What you did saying, Oceania, Oceania. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> uh, for those who aren't in on the joke, Eric really struggles with the word Oceana, so we try and throw him oh, under the bus every time. Oceana. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, um, while you're laughing at that, I'm going to give you a pop quiz. At the beginning of every single RFRX, we have a poll, and these poll questions are um, designed to kind of get you in the mindset of what we're going to be talking about today. Now, keep in mind, this is going to be a tough topic. We're going to be talking about suicide and death. So if, if something comes up for you, um, please take care of yourself, sign off, mute, or what have you. But we have three questions today. The first question is, suicide arrives, arises from either uh, A, mental illness, uh, B, our evolved human nature, um, C, both mental illness and our evolved human nature, or something else. Question number two, men are how many times more at risk for suicide than women in the United States? Is it just as likely, two times more likely, four times more likely, six times more likely, or is it 10 times more likely? And the final question is, of the following groups, which has the lowest Risk, uh, the lowest risk of suicide? Is it veterans, male physicians, women physicians, African Americans, rural men, Native American youth, nurses, single mothers, or LGBTQ? Um, so that poll will be going uh, and will be running um, while we're doing our introduction, and I'll go ahead and close it down as we uh, begin to introduce our guest. So, uh, Sasha, what, why are we here this evening? What is this all about? Well, if this is your first time to an RFRX presentation, uh, welcome. It's really great to have you all along here. So this is a special weekly program that we put on here and we've had running for a couple of years now. It's designed to provide a really wonderful, safe space for excellent guests to come and present information to us that is of help to us in the RFR community. And we, we really love having people who are qualified and able to share upbuilding, thoughtful, or insights into particular topics. So that's what brings us here today. And we really love to have everybody along. So this, of course, doesn't replace our RFR support groups or any of the other programs that we have with Recovering From Religion, but this is an extra um, thing that we have on our weekly schedule. <laughs> now, what we really like to do here with the RFRX presentations is allow this to be a safe space for people to present suggestions and ideas of topics that we can cover as well. So if you've ever got any ideas or things that you would like to share, or perhaps a discussion that you think would be of benefit, email us or contact us. You can do that through RFRX at recoveringfromreligion.org. Eric will probably put that there in the chat for you. Um, and we've had a really, really good history of previous presentations that are available on our YouTube page. So if you go to um, youtube.com, look at our Recovering From Religion section, you'll see all of the previous presentations on there. And the types of topics that we've covered, Eric, can you think of some of them? I, I've gone blank, so many different topics that we have covered over the years. Yeah, we've had uh, so uh, we're closing in on 100 shows. We'll have it sometime towards the end of March is 100 shows. And we've talked about the fear of hell. We've talked about purity culture. We've talked about conversion therapy. We've talked about so many amazing topics that are super relevant to the folks who come to RFR. Um, and we've had a ton of puns that have come through too. So if you like puns, <laughs> then you just want to pick up some of these videos. <laughs> Stop smiling, Ray. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we've really had some fantastic material. And, and yeah, I really encourage you to go and have a look at that and share some of the presentations with other friends that you might know. We really encourage you to share them on your socials, uh, let people know about the great work that we're, we're trying to do here at Recovering From Religion. But what is Recovering From Religion? What is the RFR? community based upon? Well, you probably know that we have a mission statement and it sums us up perfectly. We're here to offer hope, healing and support to people who might be struggling with issues of doubt and non-belief. We all know what it's like to perhaps question our faith or question the environment that we might have come from and how 
destabilizing and unsettling that can be. So RFI is here to offer hope, healing and support. Um, Eric, can you tell us a bit about the healing aspect of that? You bet. You might hear my dog barking in the background, so please excuse that. <laughs> um, healing. This is um, one, of the, one of the aspects and one of the programs that we put together to encourage the healing and foster healing for those who are recovering from religion is what we call the helpline. And this is a place where folks, uh, volunteers like myself, like Sasha, like so many other of these fantastic volunteers here at RFR, this is a place where um, you get to come and uh, share what's been going on with you. If you are in need of help, if you just want someone to talk to, we have volunteers who are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, either over the phone or through uh, online chat on our website, recoveringfromreligion.com. In addition to that, um, it's hard to kind of know where to go, what to look for, what what terms to put into Google in order to find what we need. But uh, uh, so when we're recovering from religion, we probably need a lot of resources. And RFR has curated a ton of resources for us. Uh, in fact, there's a whole new format too that you kind of are, will enjoy using, but head to recoveringfromreligion.com slash resources to find some resources about raising um, a parent, uh, finding yourself a secular parent, raising kids. Um, if, if you're a, a Muslim and you're looking for resources on uh, you know, ex-Muslim resources or ex-Jehovah's, we've got so many resources. So take a look at that. Um, all right, next. Um, hope, you want to talk about hope? Yeah, yeah. So we've had our healing aspect, the hope aspect. Well, I don't know about you, Eric, but I'm sure most of us can relate to the fact that when we come out of perhaps a religious bubble or we're trying to question where we fit in this world, we might think that we're completely alone. And so what we try and do through Recovering from Religion and all of our resources is provide hope and reassurance that we are all in this together. We don't expect people to think the same as us or believe the same as us. This is not a place where we have to be united like that, but we do have to be supported to and validated to understand that the journey that we are going through is okay. So the hope aspect really comes into play when we hear other people share their stories, their experiences, um, maybe listening to how they were able to reclaim a happy life and move forward with success. So we have a blog and we have a podcast where all of these things are, are available to listen to. The links will be up in the chats as well. So just recognizing the fact that we are not alone provides the hope that we really need. And then we have our support. <laughs> <aspect>. <laughs> All right, support groups. Folks, I love the support groups. Um, so for the helpline, I feel like that's kind of like an emergency room. Like I need some help now. I need to talk to someone now. I need a resource now. The support groups, the peer support groups, this is where the long-term healing can come uh, into play. This is where um, kind of the maintenance comes into play. Like what has been bugging you this last month? What have you been going through? What is uh, what have you uh, what are you struggling with? Uh, so it's almost like a general practitioner, your regular doctor type of thing. Um, these are face-to-face -face meetings, either in person, which we're starting to kind of get back, but mostly the vast majority of them are virtual. We have over 60 groups around the world, and you can find the nearest one to you at uh, the link I'm going to drop down in the chat. Um, all right. The next, the Secular Therapy Project. Oh, the Secular Therapy Project. Both the helpline and the support group program, those are peer support. Nobody is really professionally trained through the RFR training uh, to provide um, professional support. But we sometimes need more than what um, uh, peer support can offer. And so in those cases, uh, we need a professional mental health, uh, a mental health professional. So we've set up the support group uh, or the secular therapy project. And um, these therapists are vetted to ensure that they uh, see here, that they are um, have their appropriate licensing in their state or their country to make sure that they maintain a secular practice and also to make sure that they use exclusively evidence-based treatment. Uh, so get an account and sign up at uh, seculartherapy.org. Um, Sasha, online Fantastic. community? Yeah, so as we mentioned, it's really, really powerful to know that we are not in this alone. So we have a fantastic online community here through the RFIRX community. We have a way that you can interact with others who might be walking a similar path or navigating similar circumstances. We have our Zoom meetings regularly, as we mentioned, 
on Sunday night. And we also have an ability to contact helpline agents. So you can join this community just by dropping us a message, drop us a, a, uh, an email. We can add you to the community where it's a safe space to interact with other people who can be there to support you. Also want to give a big shout out to the Atheist community of Discord. They're here broadcasting this presentation and have history with all of our other presentations as well. Thank you guys so much for your support. and We love working in harmony with you as well. Um, and the link will be down there to them. And one of the other things that people often ask us is when they've received support through the RFR community, they want to know how can they help other people. So we're always looking for volunteers. If you're in a position where you might be able to volunteer some time to perhaps help run a support group or perhaps um, help with online chats or receiving calls from people who are going through a difficult time, or perhaps you're not as good with people, but you're really great with things behind the scenes. You might be good at computer programming, or help us run our websites or any of those technical things. We're always looking for volunteers so if you're in a position to do that you'd like to be able to help other people please drop us a message we'd love to make use of anything that you might be able to offer to us because that's really what RFR is all about nobody makes money out of this nobody's here to you know get any prestige or position this is just here to support people Sasha thank you so much all right, folks, um, that kind of uh, wraps it up for the introduction. Now we're going to get into the meat of our whole show. And again, please excuse Mr. Grizzly back there wanting to guard the house. Um, so uh, again, I want to uh, reiterate a second time that this is going to be a tough discussion. There may be some, uh, there'll, there'll be some talk of suicide, there'll be talk of death. And so um, if that is something that uh, will trigger you, then please make sure that you take care of yourself however you need to do that best. Um, for the first hour, we're going to have a discussion. We're going to have a, a presentation from our fantastic guest who has uh, returned for, I think, the fourth time here. And then after that, we're going to have a Q&A session. So if you have a question during the discussion, um, please type it into the chat. And uh, um, Atheist Community on Discord, that also goes for you. Uh, we'll be monitoring that as well if you've got some uh, questions. Then um, during that Q&A session, we'll be asking those questions that you asked. And um, finally, once that Q&A session is over, we're going to have some closing thoughts by our founder and president, Dr. Dale Ray. Then after that's all over, we're going to shut the recording off, open up the lines, and we'll all get to hang out. So I'm really, really excited about that. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our amazing, fantastic um, guest. You've guys seen him before. Um, uh, he's been here several times. I think this is number four, like I had mentioned. Dr. Andy Thompson is a psychiatrist at the University of Virginia Student Health Services. The 9-11 tax uh, triggered an interest in suicide terrorism, which led to the discovery of an unappreciated world of research into how and why human minds generate religious beliefs. His current, current interest is in Darwinian psychiatry, evolutionary medicine and evolutionary psychology and their applications to clinical depression, antidepressant medicate, antidepressant medication, <laughs> religious belief, substance abuse, well-being, resilience, suicide risk assessment, and psychiatric illness. Dr. Thompson has written Why We Believe in Gods, a concise, a concise guide to the science of faith, which brings that world to anyone who's interested. Dr. Thompson, welcome back, my friend. It's so good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Thank you again for having me. Uh, let's see if we can get the slides going here. Perfect. A, aloneness. B, burdensomeness. C, capacity for suicide. Again, A, B, C. Aloneness, burdensomeness, capacity for suicide. It is a simple algorithm that you can use anywhere, anytime with anybody that you are concerned is at risk for killing themselves. It is theoretically sound, it's empirically supported. And what I want to do this evening, my goals for this evening are several. First and foremost, so that when you leave tonight, the ABC algorithm and tool is in your bones and you can use it anytime, anywhere with anybody and you will understand the basis for it. That's my first and main goal. Because as I hope to show you, all of the risk factors for suicide actually map onto A, B, and C. Secondly, to show you that the wish to die is separate from the psychological ability to die. 
they're two different constructs. And so when you're thinking about somebody's suicide capacity, uh, you're also thinking about their ability to override self-preservative instinct and to kill themselves. The third goal is to show you that there's probably two kinds of, at least two kinds of suicidality that are part of human nature. What I'm going to refer to as bargaining and the more deadly uh, burdensomeness. Those are my main goals. And I also want you to see some of the thinking behind this. Uh, before we get going on this, um, I want to do a number of thank yous. First and foremost to Recovery from Religion for your work. Uh, I think it is outstanding. I've known it since getting into the days of working on my book and, and coming across Dr. Ray's work. I also want to thank a, a number of uh, very important people, Paul Andrews, Lily Martin, Jim Quinn, Dennis D. Canton Zero at McMaster University, Ed Hagen, Kristen Syme at Washington State University, Thomas Joyner at Florida State University, uh, Jesse Baring. These are researchers on suicide and if you like what I'm giving you tonight, they are the ones that deserve the credit. It is their work that I am summarizing uh, for you. And obviously one piece of this is not just so that you can potentially assess somebody's risk. And the reason that that's important is that you're more likely to stop somebody's suicide than I am. By the time they get to me, they're probably gonna live. It's people close to them that are gonna have the greatest opportunity to stay the hand. I appreciate this is a sensitive topic, but I, I hope the costs of, of, of listening to it and, and certainly some of the upset will be offset by the benefits to you. And there's obviously the other piece of this, which is just for you, if anybody here has struggled with suicide or worried about when they might be at risk, I'm hoping this will help uh, you and, and be internalized. And if it comes to your life being at risk, this will help spare it. A little bit of a map. We're gonna talk about cases, um, uh, some cases and some epidemiology, and you've gotta hold my foot to the fire. Um, any theory about suicide has to explain the epidemiology. We're gonna talk about the evolution of uh, suicide, then we're gonna talk about the two types of bargaining and burdensomeness, and I'm gonna give you some actual simple signs that you can uh, used to assess somebody's uh, risk. <clears throat> Let's start with uh, a case. On uh, July 27th, 1890, Vincent Van Gogh went up to the wheat fields that he had been painting. He took out a gun and he shot himself in the chest. Uh, he had visited his brother in Paris some weeks earlier. He'd returned early and he wrote his brother this letter. Um, there immense, he's talking about the painting, there are immense stretches of wheat fields under turbulent skies. And I made a point of trying to express sadness, extreme loneliness. So you see the A, the loneliness. Um, Vincent's brother, Theo, lived in Paris about 20 miles away with his wife and his child, Theo. Um, I'm sorry, the child's name was Vincent. Um, and so uh, Theo was not a wealthy man. Theo uh, was an assistant art dealer. Um, Teo supported his brother Vincent for the last 10 years of his life. Vincent Van Gogh sold one painting in his lifetime. Uh, his brother uh, supported him. In that same letter, um, and, and Vincent had, had become uncomfortable in Paris and he'd gone back to the little village, uh, uh, I think it's Auvoir Suaz, um, and this was also in his letter. I was afraid, not entirely, but nevertheless a little, that my being a burden on you was something you found intolerable. So you see the aloneness and the burdensomeness. And realistically at times, Vincent was a burden on his brother. Uh, but his brother Teo believed in him, believed in his art. What do we know about Vincent's capacity for suicide? Uh, if you remember in uh, 1888, he cut off his ear when Van Gogh threatened to leave Arles. His life was one of physical deprivation, uh, injury. He had at least two uh, suicide attempts when he was in the asylum after he cut off his ear. So he's desensitized. He's desensitized to self-injury. So the capacity for suicide is a desensitization and the ability to override self-preservative instinct. 
So you see in Van Gogh's case, A, B, C. What's the epidemiology here? About a million people will kill themselves uh, this year. That's more than war and homicide combined but you have 10 to 20 million attempts each year. So any theories about suicide are going to have to uh, be able to explain the difference between attempts, gestures, and completed suicides. Um, some of you may remember uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin, who uh, I think is an extraordinary individual. Um, he uh, led one of the impeachment investigations. He lost his, uh, he has two children. He lost his oldest son to suicide. Uh, right at the end of 2020, and speaks poignantly about the devastation that his uh, son's death has uh, caused. Um, we know that uh, in this country, uh, American Indians and Native uh, Alaskan youth have uh, very high rates of suicide, and, and keep the number uh, 15 per 100,000 per year. That, that's basically how it's uh, done. Uh, and they've got probably twice that rate, both the men and women. In our, with our LGBTQ brothers and sisters, they have an increased rate. How can we explain this? Two to seven times the death rate by suicide, five times more likely to make an attempt. Um, it's higher in uh, those with rejecting families. We know that four out of 10, 40% of transgender individuals will make a suicide attempt. It, there's an epidemic in rural um, uh, America. And, and look at that rate, 84 per 100,000 per year. Remember the base rate is 15. And I think uh, Sasha was talking before we started about uh, there being high rates of suicide in Australia among farmers in the rural. How can we explain this? And I think one of the reasons is there's a lot of aloneness, there's a lot of stress and farmers are are very frequently suffer physical injuries. They're desensitized to physical pain and suffering. Uh, veterans, uh, I think many people know the, the, the high rates in uh, veterans. Um, 140 people will die by suicide in the United States today. 20 to 25 of them will be veterans. Um, 100,000 veterans have died since 9-11. Look at the rate, again, Keep the number 15 in mind, 38 per 100,000 per year. And in the young veterans, it is 70 per 100,000 per year. And the high rates of suicide remain in veterans throughout um, the life course. High rates of uh, suicide in veterans, in older veterans in Arizona, for instance. Um, <clears throat> if you are dealing with a veteran, you don't wanna just ask about firearms in the home but we know that one in three veterans keep firearms that are at, at least one of them is unlocked and loaded. Two out of three veterans store at least one firearm unlocked. Half of them store at least one firearm loaded. So you want to know not only about uh, firearms in the home, but if they're unlocked and loaded. Um, this cartoon says, uh, I'd like to keep my gun on. And uh, you always want to know about the presence of firearms in a home. Every time you hear about a homicide, at least in the United States, um, you want to keep in mind that two people have died by suicide. The mere presence of a gun in a home raises the rate across all age groups. In the United States, the first time a woman purchases a gun, half of those purchases are for the purpose of suicide. So, um, you know, we murder a lot of people in this country every year, but um, twice the number of homicides are, are suicides. The, the risk of death from guns is suicide more than homicide. The homeless, we know that one out of 10 die by suicide. And the great comic Robin Williams called the homeless the MIAs, the missing in America. Uh, I thought it was an extraordinary description but one out of 10 will die by suicide. And, and I, you know, I, any theory I give you, you, you've got to hold my foot to the fire. I have to be able to explain that. We know that women physicians are three to five times higher risk of suicide than uh, women who are not physicians. We know that male physicians are one and a half to three times higher risk of suicide. So 
just being an MD. I've got one and a half to three times the risk. And the general ratio, at least in the United States, is four males for every um, woman. That's the uh, of completed suicide. But in physicians, it's almost uh, one to one. Um, three to 400 physicians will, in the United States will die by suicide. And again, look at the rate. It's somewhere between 30 and 40 per 100,000 per year. Nurses, four times the higher risk of suicide than their uh, women peers. Huge increased risk. Well, why? What's the difference here? And the argument that I would submit is that physicians and nurses are desensitized to harming human bodies. Um, you, you can't get uh, an education in healthcare, nursing, physician's assistants, physi you know, without hurting human bodies. So you're desensitized. Um, <clears throat> I would encourage people, if they've not seen it, to look at the New York Times article on Lorna Breen. Um, uh, she was an outstanding emergency room physician in New York City who uh, committed suicide uh, during the COVID epidemic. She, she was an extraordinary physician on the front lines during the COVID epidemic, and uh, she died by suicide. It's particularly poignant for us here because her family is in Charlottesville, Virginia, and she came here to be with them when she got depressed and she actually died here. But there, there's an excellent article in the New York Times about her that I'd encourage you to read, and it will illustrate many of the things that I'm uh, telling you. Um, I think this is an interesting example. Um, Buzz Aldrin, the second man on the moon, his mother's maiden name was Moon, Marion Moon uh, Aldrin. And one year before he walked on the moon, his mother committed suicide. And she knew he had been chosen to make the moon voyage. And uh, he worked very hard to hide his mother's suicide from NASA for fear that um, they would pull him from the mission. Uh, her father had also committed suicide. I, I bring up this because what we see is that that ratio of four to one is shifting. In the state of Virginia, where I am, the ratio is now uh, down to three men uh, for every woman. Uh, so there's increased risk in women. Um, what about the effects of suicide? That, that's just the epidemiology. What about the effects of suicide? Six months after Vincent Van Gogh's death, his brother Teo died, uh, many said of a broken heart. Teo was devastated by his brother's uh, death. Um, uh, Van Gogh had shot himself in the chest. He'd survived for two days. His brother came from Paris and was with him when he died, and, and he was utterly devastated, and that's reflected in the letters. And the two men are buried in the graveyard um, right uh, near the wheat field. The graveyard for the church is right across from the wheat field, and they're buried together. Uh, he was utterly devastated. Um, and, and the death by suicide for the families that survive is devastating. This is from Kay Jameson, one of the world's experts on bipolar disorder, one of the world's experts on suicide. This is from her book, Night Falls Fast. And I think it expresses it beautifully. There's no way to heal the hearts or settle the minds of those left behind in suicide's dreadful wake. Um, uh, you probably don't recognize the young man on the right. Um, this is uh, Anderson Cooper. Uh, many of you may watch him on CNN. Um, Anderson Cooper, when he was 21, I think 22 years of age, his older brother Carter committed suicide. And there is nobody more eloquent at talking about the impact of suicide on survivors than Anderson Cooper. It's been, uh, I think, 30 years since his brother's death. And he, he says, not a day goes by. Um, and he makes the point that there is no such thing as closure. It is devastating. Um, there's no such thing. Um, so that gives you some idea of the epidemiology. Um, the impact of suicide, let's go to its origins. And again, we are biological creatures. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And the argument I'm gonna make for you is that we have at least two uh, evolved capacities for suicide. 
bargaining and burdensomeness. And I think there's an interesting piece of history here. Darwin's great idea of, hist of, uh, of evolution by natural selection actually came about, you could say it rests on two suicides. If you go to the tip of South America, to a desolate place called Famine Bay, um, to a graveyard, um, uh, Commander Pringle Stokes is buried there. And Pringle Stokes was the first commander of HMS Beagle. And in 1828, he um, uh, became severely depressed and he um, committed suicide and is buried uh, there at the tip of South America. The captain of the fleet appointed a 23-year-old young man, uh, Robert Fitzroy, to take his place. And Robert Fitzroy stepped in. He's 23 years old. He completes the first voyage of the Beagle. He does an outstanding job. They appoint him um, to continue as captain. Fitzroy was very worried. He knew that uh, you know, the captain of a ship had no connection with the men. They were very isolated. And uh, it had, may have already gotten to Fitzroy, we don't know. Um, Fitzroy probably had bipolar illness. So Fitzroy is uh, gonna go on the second voyage of the Beagle as captain, but he's worried about being alone. And so Fitzroy uh, cast about for a young gentleman who would accompany him. So he would have somebody that was not one of the sailors or one of the other officers who would share his cabin that he could talk to. And of course, the young man that uh, he ended up uh, choosing and went with him uh, was Charles Darwin. Now, Fitzroy, at age 17, had lost his uncle, Lord Castlereagh, a very public suicide. Lord Castlereagh was the Henry Kissinger equivalent of the day. He was the one as responsible for defeating Napoleon um, as anybody. And he had a, a very public suicide when Fitzroy was 17 years of age. And Fitzroy, we're not sure, but Fitzroy may have already been depressed and we don't know, maybe even suicidal at times. Um, but he chose uh, Charles Darwin uh, to accompany him on the voyage of the Beagle. And as they say, the rest is history. Um, um, Fitzroy never got over having uh, been part of Darwin's discovery. And uh, anybody wanna guess how uh, Admiral Fitzroy died? We owe a lot to Admiral Fitzroy. He actually was the inventor of weather forecasting. Um, he was way ahead of his time. But in 1865, uh, Fitzroy committed suicide in the same manner that his uncle had many, many years before. All right, <clears throat> suicide is throughout nature and we don't appreciate that. Uh, this is from Ecclesiastes, for that which befalleth the sons of men, the fall of beasts, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. And what we would call suicide is throughout nature. I'll give you just some examples. This is the Australian uh, redback spider. The female is on the bottom, the male is on the top. The male starts to copulate with the female, does a backflip. Most of the time, the female um, uh, consumes the male. And when that happens, the male fertilizes more eggs and the female is less likely to copulate with another uh, male anytime soon. So dying by suicide in the act of copulation is reproductively successful. It's not good for the male, but he's reproductively more successful if he dies while copulating. Um, I don't know why all these things are in Australia. This is the Australian social spider. Um, and there are a bunch of other Australian examples, uh, Sasha. Um, this is the uh, Australian social spider. And when she gives birth to about a hundred offspring, she turns her body into jello and she's consumed in a kind of postpartum meal. So you can see that this is deadly for her, but is crucial for the survival of her offspring. One last animal example, which is important, is the P. aphid because the P. aphid has two mechanisms of suicide, uh, which is what I'm arguing for humans. And the P. aphid, if it's infected by a wasp larvae, will fall off the bush and make sure it gets away from its kin and uh, dies or is uh, uh, eaten. Um, 
The other me mechanism is that the P. aphid is the original suicide terrorist. Um, its main predator is the ladybug. If a ladybug approaches a group of P. aphids, a P. aphid will approach it. They have a mustard oil on the back of their neck. They blow themselves up, they die, and either kill or seriously wound the ladybug, and it sends a signal to their kin to flee. So you see two evolved mechanisms in the same organism. This is the standard view of Darwinian natural selection. Um, a Gary Larson cartoon. This is how we think about it, but it's not quite accurate. Natural selection works at the level of the individual, but it's deeper. It's at the level of the gene. Um, 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 a, an Australian poet for you, <laughs> Sasha. Life slim volume spirally bound. And if you step back from it, that's going to make sense because what's the fundamental unit of life? It is um, DNA, our genes. That's the fundamental, fundamental unit of life. So that's where evolution is going to act, not on the individual or the individual body. And so this is the modern Darwinian synthesis, that the organism is DNA's way of making more DNA. All of us are biodegradable packages designed by our genes to get our genes to the next generation. There's, ne there's no necessary benefit to the organism of natural selection. It's only to the organism's genes. Right. You look at the coronavirus pandemic that we're in the middle of, okay? The coronavirus is just the shell. The genes that create the greatest infectivity are the genes that are going to survive. Natural selection works at the level of the gene. So this leads to a situation where my death is worth more than my life to my genes in certain situations. Make it real simple here. Let's say I have three children. Each one has 50% of my genes. If my killing myself augments their survival and reproductive success, that's 150% of my genes. It only takes 2% advantage for a trait to become instantiated in an organism in very few generations. Right. So again, um, we can have situations where our deaths are worth more than our lives for our genes. And this is at the core, particularly of the burdensome kind of suicide. A way of thinking about the human mind is the mind is what the brain does. And, and it, it evolved under the same rules of natural selection. And it's sort of like the Apollo spacecraft. The Apollo spacecraft is this compact array of engineering devices um, uh, interpreting a constant stream of information only some of which actually makes conscious awareness of the astronaut. So the argument here is that all of us are sitting on at least two mechanisms for suicide that can get triggered and be deployed, bar bargaining and burdensomeness. Another way of looking at the uh, implication of the modern Darwinian synthesis, um, I don't know if you can see the cartoon, but these are uh, polar bears uh, diving off a cliff. And one of them says, well, my psychiatrist says, if it makes you happy, do it. And uh, what this illustrates is the modern Darwinian synthesis, which is our thoughts, our feelings, our behavior, they're all designed for our genes benefit, not necessarily our own individual self-interest. There can be a conflict between self-interest and survival, and uh, death, and in this case, death by suicide. Right. Again, uh, there are situations where one's death may be worth more than one's life to uh, one's genes in ancestral environments, which we'll get to. All right. So suicide did not evolve in 19th century Vienna. Okay, We are risen apes, not fallen angels. Um, we are the descendants of partially um, bipedal apes, um, Miocene apes that lived over 5 million years ago. Um, if you want a wonderful book about all this, uh, there's a great book called Fossil Men, 
uh, about the most recent uh, people who've uh, uh, put together the fossils from Africa and have revised the human evolutionary tree. Um, and it's very hard to get our minds around the time sequences here. And if we just take one day like today and we make every hour 100,000 years, so 24 hours is 2.4 million years, our genus Homo shows up at midnight. 2.4 million years ago, our species doesn't show up until somewhere between nine and 10 o'clock. Fully formed Homo sapiens don't show up until like 1120. And it's uh, 10 minutes before midnight that we settle down into agricultural communities in the Near East. Um, and so these capacities for suicide evolved in ancient African environments, the savannas of Africa. That's what formed human nature, right? Um, and that um, for most of our evolutionary history, uh, life was an endless camping trip with close relatives. And, and these are the circumstances, the social circumstances that designed the capacities we have for suicide. That's the argument. Um, and so any time you think about any human trait, um, it, its origins are in the evolutionary past. Now, why are we the last surviving hominid? And one of the arguments is, is because we achieved what the insects achieved, something called eusociality. Eusociality is multi-generational care of the young, cooperative care of the young. I'll gladly hand you my two-year-old grandson to hold. Um, a chimpanzee mother won't let her sister hold her offspring. So we have um, cooperative care of the young, division of labor. Think of all the different jobs the people in this uh, Zoom call tonight do. The myriad jobs were the most uh, cooperative species on earth and division of labor. We defend local uh, com uh, communal locales. Think of what the, um, you, know, you know, think of what's going on right now in. Uh, with the Ukrainians defending their country. Um, but we also have, uh, you, part of the characteristics of youth sociality is altruistic suicide, self-sacrifice. And there is no youth social species without lethal self-sacrifice. And we're a youth social species. And there's no self-sacrifice in non-youth social species. That's some of the biologic Darwinian background. Let's now get into the nitty gritty. And the idea here is that there are at least two kinds of suicidality that have evolved, which help us understand the difference between suicide gestures. Um, these are people who will, will, will communicate their suicidality often um, and, and they're less likely to die. The people that quietly make the decision don't tell anybody that's the, the the more lethal usually is the burdensome kind. And this helps us understand suicide gestures, which again, 10 to 20 times, maybe more uh, completed suicide. But that capacity sits in all of us. Um, and it, it, one of the things it utilizes is something called um, hard to fake, costly, honest signaling. With the invention of language became the uh, ability to lie. So how do you know that I'm being honest when I talk to you? Uh, if I tell you I'm depressed, why should you believe me? If I cut my wrist, that's a hard to fake, costly, honest signal. It's crucial to so many things. A, a diamond engagement ring is a costly, um, honest signal, a hard to fake, costly, honest signal. And religions use them all over the place. Um, is there anybody that doubts the uh, commitment to his faith of the young man in the upper right, uh, or the, the Shia Muslims who are whipping themselves. Hard to fake, costly, honest signaling. And this kind of suicidality utilizes that capacity. So the bargaining kind of suicide occurs where there are intolerable social situations and problems. The individual is usually powerless to solve them without help, but they're often formidable conflicts with potential helpers. Um, there's often sublethal injuries. These people will communicate their suicidality. Um, they know or hope that intervention is probable or inevitable. 
Um, these are ordeals that they, um, um, whose passage they hope will lead to a desired income, a desired outcome, but if it doesn't, they're willing to pay the cost. Um, it serves a number of functions. It can mitigate anger. A patient of mine who was arrested um, became suicidal trying to, because she knew her husband was going to be furious with her. They were poor um, and it, it, you know, she'd gotten arrested. It was going to cost a lot of money to get her out of trouble. Um, so you can mitigate anger or punishment. Think of the, the suicide gestures before people are arrested or in jail. Um, it's signaling, it's leverage. But these are, these are mechanisms that are designed for small groups where you're highly interdependent. If we were a, a group on the savannas of Africa, we'd be related to each other, most of us, and we would be mutually interdependent for our survival. And, and it's a gambit to improve one situation when you're in a conflict. But in the modern world, we can, um, you know, we can abandon relationships with very little cost. And so often these signals don't work. Um, and, and these are situations where an individual can't get angry um, or, or anger would be ineffective or impossible to deploy or would get them in trouble. And you're, it, you're basically threatening to withhold benefits. Um, and if you're crucial in a cooperative relationship or think you are, you can afford this kind of costly signaling. Not as much in the modern world as in the ancestral world, probably. But again, it is more than a threat. You still need one another. Um, you wanna make the relationship work. Uh, and the desired outcome is actually to change the relationship uh, and towards the individual's interest. That's why it's called uh, bargaining. Um, this New Yorker cartoon illustrates it. You can see this uh, chef is standing on a ledge and um, the reporter is saying, they're going to print a retraction. Your desserts are not inconsistent. And it's meant to be funny, but it's not. Um, what this chef is doing is making a hard to fake, costly, honest signal trying to force a change from presumably the New York Times. They're powerless, they're in conflict, they're trying to force a change. Think of the people that went on a hunger strike, the, the families of the passengers that were on the Malaysian airline that went down. If you remember, they went on a hunger strike trying to force the Malaysian government to do more about the, the, um, the plane. Think of Mahatma Gandhi's hunger strikes against the British Empire, threatening to die um, and forcing the British Empire to uh, change. Um, think of the IRA hunger strikers and Margaret Thatcher wouldn't budge and they died. So it doesn't always work. Um, but here's where it gets complicated because there's a mismatch between the ancestral world and the modern world. And uh, somebody can make a suicide gesture using Tylenol thinking that it's harmless and a Tylenol overdose can kill you. I lost a patient some years ago. Her fiance broke off their engagement and she was uh, just devastated and she called him on the phone one night, begging him to come back and saying she was suicidal and she was taking an Ativan overdose. And um, she thought Ativan wouldn't kill her. And in most instances, it wouldn't have. What she didn't know is that she had pulmonary fibrosis. She took enough Ativan that she died of respiratory failure. So one of the confusions in the modern world is some suicide gestures that are not meant to be lethal can become quite lethal unintended. Um, and um, people often underestimate the lethality of some of the means they're using for gestures. And even I have even know of cases where people were using guns thinking they were making a gesture. They were just gonna try to wound themselves uh, as a gesture and they died. So um, it, it is serious. And also people, as we'll see, um, there, there's a reluctance to die. There's a hope of being saved, but there is often resolution to face the risk and abide by the outcome. And the reason for this is that one function of a 
of a suicide gesture is to assay um, uh, private views. Um, if, you know, how do you really feel about me? You, you say you are on my side, but if I'm suicidal, you know, will you, will you be there for me? So suicide gestures are often intended to reveal private views, but it's a dangerous thing to do. It's a gamble. And as I said, in the modern world where relationships generally are not probably as strong as ancestral communities, um, you can often lose. And what you can see, I'm, I'm presenting these things as two different uh, uh, types of suicide, but what you can see is a bargaining kind of suicidality can very quickly become a burdensome kind of suicidality. You realize that people aren't invested in you. People don't care about you. And it plunges you into uh, the more deadly kind of suicide. And uh, an example, um, Abraham Lincoln, I assume you recognize the picture. Um, Abraham Lincoln, we know, was suicidal at least on two occasions. Uh, the first occasion was um, in, I think, uh, 1833. I can't see my number on the slide, but, um, and, and here's the circumstance. He'd escaped the, the, the indentured servitude of his father. He was living in New Salem. Um, he had fallen in love with Ann Rutledge. Ann Rutledge was engaged to another man. Um, did he have sex with her? We don't know. I think you can make a case, possibly, but certainly he was courting somebody who was already engaged to another uh, man. She died of an infectious illness, I think typhoid. Uh, Lincoln became profoundly depressed and openly suicidal. Um, and uh, 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 the, the quotes uh, come from Herndon's biography. Uh, people in New Salem reported they, Lincoln told me that he felt like committing suicide. Mr. Lincoln's friends were compelled to keep watch and ward over Mr. Lincoln, um, being from the sudden shock, somewhat temporarily, the sudden shock of Ann's death, temporarily deranged um, uh, for fear of an accident. You know? And so um, I think Lincoln was assaying his value to that community, but I think he was seriously suicidal because otherwise he was alone, potentially huge shame involved. Um, but I think that was probably in the gesture kind of, uh, uh, you know, that end of the spectrum. In 1841, I think he was seriously suicidal and the burdensome kind potentially. Um, he, he, his political career was over. He and a group had inadvertently in the state legislature bankrupted the state of Illinois. Um, his political career seemed to be over. He was engaged to Mary Todd. He could see that Mary Todd was severely disturbed. He wanted out of the engagement, but that's something you couldn't do in his circumstance. And he was, had also fallen in love with Matilda Edwards and his best friend, Joshua Speed, was also in love with Matilda Edwards. And um, Lincoln got profoundly depressed and, and um, pe the people around him were convinced that he was gonna kill himself. Um, how much was trying to see if people would forgive him for um, particularly uh, bankrupting the state, I and mean, we'll never know, but there's no question, but we know of at least two occasions where Lincoln was suicidal and he wrote a poem about it, an anonymous poem that people are fairly convinced uh, he uh, wrote that appeared, I think in the 1830s. Um, now, you, you can reasonably ask me, well, what does the anthropologic record show? Uh, what I'm telling you holds no water whatsoever unless you can show it in the anthropologic record in hunter-gatherer societies, and you can. And there are numerous examples where um, both kinds of suicide are present, and uh, the bargaining kind is, is present. This is just one example from Ed Hagen's extraordinary work. Um, suicide threats are used to put pressure on others in disputes. Uh, this was in, a, in Angola. All right, let's switch to the final and the more uh, deadly kind, um, the burdensome kind of suicide. And again, it's all over the anthropologic record. Um, in the Crow Indians, if you were old and sick or both, you were expected to kill yourselves. Um, um, and this is called negative inclusive fitness. It was first written about by Dennis D. Canton Zero at McMaster University. 
And uh, these are situations where there are poor prospects for future reproduction, little, uh, little ability to invest in relatives. You're imposing high costs on kins. You, you're a burden. Um, and again, you see it all over the anthropologic record. These are Samoans. Again, if you're old and sick, you're expected to kill yourself. Um, there's an interesting example among some Eskimos uh, in Canada where it's ritualized. If, if I come to Sasha and he is a relative of mine and I ask him to assist me in killing myself, on the third request, he is obligated, if he's a relative, to help me. And it's ritualized. There's a particular place, particular clothes. And so again, uh, just one of many examples of the cultural expression of the burdensomeness kind. Um, this just uh, is a schematic of it. So uh, aloneness or thwarted belongingness, um, you know, a desire for suicide, perceived burdensomeness, a desire for suicide, then the capacity for suicide. And if you get all three, it's kind of a lethal triangle. Um, first suicide note that we have in recorded history, Egypt, I'm laden with misery and lack a trusty friend, aloneness. Um, an interesting thing happened on 9-11. Around 9-11, 96 people a day were dying by suicide in the United States. Uh, I think it dropped to 39 that day. Uh, the country, if you remember, if you were alive then, you know, came together and the suicide rate uh, dropped. Uh, one would predict, for instance, in the Ukraine that the suicide rate uh, will drop during this period of time. Um, Albert Einstein got seriously suicidal when he was 19. He felt like he was a burden on his family. He was not a good investment uh, and it would be a lot better if he uh, didn't uh, if he continued not to live. Fortunately, he did. Um, how do you pick up on this? Um, listen for statements that people would be better off if I was gone, um, that I'm a burden. Um, I, you know, my friends and family would be better off if I, was, if I disappeared. Um, Self-hatred, and, and particularly recent loss of competence, and again, particularly in men. Uh, but also in women. And, um, um, and, and I want to just break down this piece here of uh, self-hatred and loss of competency. Um, I think these are some of the proximal steps to listen for. Somebody feels like they are falling short of expectations, even if it's unreasonable. And they are really blaming themselves and demonizing themselves. I'm worthless. Um, intense self-consciousness. It looks like they're narcissistic, but they're not. They're preoccupied with what they feel is unforgivable or shameful failures. There's intense negative emotion, negative affect. And, and you know, they might deny suicidal feelings, but if you see this cluster of, uh, of things going on in an individual, it's something to worry about. Um, I would encourage you to look up Virginia Woolf's suicide note on Wikipedia. I think it's a, a superb example of the burdensomeness kind of suicide. This is just part of it. Um, I can't, and it's the note she left for her husband, Leonard Wolf. I can't fight any longer. I know that I'm spoiling your life, that without me, you could work. Everything is gone from me, but the certainty of your goodness, I can't go on spoiling your life any longer. I don't think two people could have been happier than we have been. Um, I, I doubt Leonard Wolf felt that way. Um, but uh, she came to perceive herself as a burden on him and took her life. And I would, and her depression was coming back. I'd encourage you to read her full suicide note. It illustrates, uh, I think, uh, the essence of my talk. And this is what Kay Jamison wrote after Robin Williams' suicide. Um, and uh, Kay Jamison uh, herself made a lethal suicide attempt, and fortunately, her brother and the physicians at the UCLA ICU uh, saved her. And she knows it firsthand. And th this was an op-ed piece she wrote after Robin Williams died. Um, now this is long, but I think it's important because you, at times you, you can't believe that somebody's suicidal because they seem to have a good fortune in life and they have um, you know, a, a, a wonderful life. Why would they be suicidal? And um, 
uh, again, I think uh, there's nobody better at it, writing about it than uh, Jameson. And this is about her suicidality. And um, no amount of love from other people, and there was a lot, could help. No advantage of a caring family, fabulous job, was enough to overcome the pain and hopelessness. No passionate or romantic love, however strong, could make a difference. Nothing alive and warm could make its way in. I knew, convinced that my life was a shambles, and I believed incontestab incontestably that my family, friends, patients would be better off without me. Um, I thought my death would free up the wasted energies and well-meaning efforts that were being wasted on my, uh, on my behalf. So it's important it, not just to ask if people feel like um, people would be better off without them, but if they feel like they're, they're not worth investing in, that, that people shouldn't uh, commit uh, time, love, and, and resources to them. Uh, again, it's, a, I think, a, a very a, a, a huge warning sign. Um, so again, the, the, pers the uh, persistence of misperception that one's death unburdens others is, is, I think, one of the most important signs. Um, what's the evidence? Okay, show me the evidence. A, a phenomenal study from Thomas Joyner's people. They took suicide notes and they just gave them to people to read and, um, um, and asked to rate the degree of burdensomeness expressed. Everybody agreed. The notes that expressed the most burdensomeness were from the people who died by suicide. Uh, and the most extreme burdensome expressed were the people who used the most violent means, absolutely sure that they ended their lives. Um, now, this may seem odd, but uh, an important thing to tell people is never kill yourself while you're suicidal. And the reason for that is that no matter how awful you feel, what the research shows is that you know, usually that will abate somewhat in 24 hours. You cannot sustain that acute, miserable, intense suicidality for very long. The self preservative instinct kicks in, something kicks in. So if you can, because I have people ask me all the time, well, if somebody's committed to their death, why spend time, you know, trying to save them, okay? It's because if you stop somebody who's absolutely committed to their death by suicide, if you can stop them, Nine out of 10 of those individuals will uh, survive and go on and not die by suicide. Only one in 10 will go ahead and kill themselves. Um, this is, an example of this is the people who survived jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. These are people obviously committed to their deaths by suicide and some survive. And, and what they all say is as soon as they jumped, they regretted it. You know, even the most committed to overcoming self preservative instinct. All right. Now, so that's aloneness and burdensomeness. The final piece is capacity for suicide. And uh, this is the acquired capacity for lethal self-harm, being able to override self preservative instinct. Another example from history, Meriwether Lewis, um, after he became famous, he was governor of Missouri, he failed badly. He had to go back to Washington and he uh, also probably had bipolar illness, and he had several suicide attempts. He killed himself, I think, somewhere in Tennessee, um, and he was staying at a tavern upstairs. People heard uh, gunshots. They went upstairs. He was still alive, and he was cutting himself up with a razor, and he was allegedly heard to say this, I am no coward, but I'm strong. It is so hard to die. One of the things uh, one of the take home points I, I want to leave with you is the idea that somehow suicide is weakness is simply wrong. Okay. It is a fearsome, difficult act. Okay. It does not come out of a place of weakness. It is very difficult to kill yourself. Um, that's why we have suicide by cop. Um, um, these are people who, you know, can't do it themselves. They get somebody else to do it. Um, so again, the capacity to engage in suicidal behavior is different from the desire to engage in suicidal behavior. And I think that helps us understand some of the epidemiology. How do we measure the capacity? Experiences of pain and fear. It's substance abuse histories 
People are not intoxicated when they kill themselves, but they have substance abuse histories that have left them alone, unemployed, often having had medical illnesses, uh, falls, injuries. So they're desensitized to physical pain. Um, people who do a lot of self-harm, cutting, are at higher risk. We've, all, we've known that. Um, people that are heavily tattooed, unfortunately, are at higher risk because they've submitted their bodies to pain. Uh, eating disorders, uh, particularly anorexia, has a very high rate of suicide because the people are desensitized to suppressing a basic life force, uh, hunger. Um, some of you may remember Mick Jagger's girlfriend, L. Ren Scott, a long history of anorexia, and she killed herself when he said he did not want children, was not going to marry her, and uh, her business was failing. But she was at high risk for multiple reasons, but one of the main risks was the long history of anorexia nervosa. Um, exposure to or participation in violence. Uh, this is why physical or sexual abuse when young is a risk factor. Uh, you've, you've sustained bodily injuries. Um, this may be why combat or combat training, it may not be combat, but it may be combat training and the desensitization of the use of firearms that uh, uh, create the risk for veterans. Um, there's no such thing as an impulsive suicide. Um, uh, people want to say it's an impulse, but usually people have been thinking about it for a long time um, at some level. Um, Think of the uh, professional bike riders. We know that there are 60 winners of the Tour de France. There are three known suicides, probably a fourth. And they're subjecting their bodies to pain. And now we know with the IV drugs and all that, there's even more subjecting the body to pain. And again, veterans. It's probably combat training and the desensitization to physical injury and firearms. Same thing with healthcare professionals any kind of medical training, you become desensitized to harming human bodies. Um, this is a long quote, but it's important and I'll read it. Uh, it's written by a Dr. Green. Um, we steeled ourselves, um, I can't, I'm blocked on the top line. Um, as interns and residents, we had to do things that hurt other people. We dealt with it largely by hurting ourselves, drudgery, mercilessly long hours, no sleep, endless time spent in the operating room holding retractors, god-awful physical self-punishment of every kind. We hurt ourselves while we were hurting other people, sticking them with all kinds of needles, shooting them with all kinds of strong medicine, performing all kinds of painful procedures, letting them die. And this may be at the core of the increased capacity in physicians and healthcare workers, nurses. Um, past suicide attempts, we know uh, are a predictor. And this may be why, because past suicide attempts desensitize you to uh, self-harm and suicide, aborted suicide attempts, regret at surviving, another way of measuring it. Multiple attempters are probably further along the trajectory. Um, and so they, they're on a more hair trigger for entering suicidal crises. Um, if somebody is able to sustain uh, for a long period of time, very complex suicidal ideation, they become desensitized. If somebody can pick a time, place, and a means, that tells you they become desensitized and have capacity. Um, Anthony Bourdain, many of you may have seen him or followed him, tragic story, but he had been talking about killing himself for at least 10 years, including very specific hanging myself in a lonely in the, hanging myself in the shower stall of my lonely hotel room. I mean, he was uh, um, uh, you know, on the edge of suicide for a long time before he killed himself. Um, you can ask people, um, do, you have the, do you feel you have the capacity? Do you feel like you have the determination to kill yourself? Um, and, and I think you know, people don't expect that kind of question. Never ask somebody if they have the courage to kill themselves because that sounds like it's weakness if they don't. Remember, it is very hard to kill yourself. You're contemplating a fierce, dangerous act. And if somebody said any other response other than a definitive no, if you say, do you have the capacity or determination to kill yourself? And anything other than no, they go, well, maybe, or anything other than a definitive no, 
means that they've got some fearlessness about their own death. They've got capacity. Um, agitation, insomnia, weight loss, social withdrawal. And the last thing we'll talk about is the thousand yard stare, the low blink rate. Um, this is from an actual patient file in Virginia in 2005. The person who took the notes didn't know the meaning of what they were writing. The patient denies suicidal ideation. The patient um, is very nonverbal, very quiet. He sits in the chair looking down at the floor. The patient does not blink. Person didn't know the significance of this. Um, this was uh, Cho, the Virginia Tech uh, a massacre who did the murder-suicide at Virginia Tech, the low blink rate. And the reason for this is that um, if you're seriously suicidal, uh, there's somebody out to murder you. There's somebody stalking you who's going to murder you. It happens to be you. And it turns on anti-predator mechanisms that we all have. Think about how you would behave if you knew somebody right now was stalking you with the intent of killing you, okay? That's gonna get stirred up in the suicidal person. And simultaneously, they're aroused and shut down, they're pacing, they're irritable, they're withdrawn, they stop eating, stop having sex. You know, somebody's out to murder them and their anti-predator mechanisms get turned on, right? Um, the killer is close at hand, it's inescapable. We'll get to the thousand yard stare in a moment. Um, but this is why you want to trust your gut. Somebody says that they're not suicidal and you just have a feeling that they are. Um, this is the, the reason because their anti-predator mechanisms are turned on, so are yours. You know, if, if you pick, we pick up on other people's fear very quickly. If you're talking to somebody and they see a tiger coming in the room, you're going to pick up on it before they can even tell you. Okay. So if somebody absolutely denies that they're suicidal and you're uncomfortable and you feel like you're that, that, that this, this isn't right, it may be because they've decided to kill themselves. They're hiding it, but their own anti-predator mechanisms are turned on. They're agitated. They're withdrawn. They've got the thousand yard stare and you want to trust your gut. Now, the thousand yard stare, what is that? We know that men going into combat, men going into boxing or women, men and women going into boxing matches, their blink rate goes down. When you're facing a fearsome, difficult, potentially deadly situation, your blink rate goes way down. Normally we blink about 20 times a minute, every three seconds. If we're acutely depressed, our blink rate goes up. But if we, are, if, if we are committed to a fearsome, difficult act, our blink rate goes way down. So if somebody's not blinking, you, you, want, you seriously want to look at somebody's blink rate. Because if they're not blinking, that's a sign. Okay? And um, I, don't, I don't know how many of you remember the Heaven's Gate people, who there's 36 people who um, followed in this cult, and they, they committed suicide. And... A week or two before they did, they left their statements. And you can pull up the YouTube. And, and uh, I, I suggest you pull it up, turn off the volume, and just watch some of it, and you'll see the blink rate is down. It's hard. It's not the best quality video. And so the one I would suggest looking at is go to about 17 minutes, 15 minutes, and particularly the woman on the left in the, in the check, brown check uh, blouse. And watch her as she's talking. <laughs> Watch her eyes and watch her affect. The blink rate is frozen. And these are people who've already decided to end their lives. Um, blink rate is observable. You don't need any specialty training. You don't have to ask for voluntary disclosure. People don't know that you're watching their eyes. And it is so hard to predict suicide that it's, it's important, anything that we can uh, utilize. And it's something to keep in your back pocket if somebody's withdrawn and they're not blinking, regardless of what they say, worry. Um, this is uh, three questions you can ask people. Um, these days I'm close to other people, yes or no? These days the people in my life would be happier without me, yes or no? Uh, I'm not at all afraid to die, yes or no? 
three questions um, to you know either yes or no. And obviously, um, if they say um, um, they're not close to people and uh, people would be happier without them and they're not afraid to die, you've got ABC. So the essence of the talk is this. The final common pathway of all, if you look at all those risk factors, the final common pathway on all those risk factors falls on ABC, an intractable sense of aloneness, an intractable sense of failure and burdensomeness, and, and the capacity to kill themselves, fearlessness and pain toleration, and the ability to override the self-preservative instinct. So in summary, it's very simple. Remember um, your ABCs. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Dr. Thompson, thank you so much for sharing this with us today and coming and talking to us. I got quite a bit out of it myself. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, quite a few questions. Uh, you feel uh, ready to kind of go into this? Absolutely. And All right. uh, I appreciate it was long and I appreciate people hanging in there, but I hope you see that um, I think this is just crucial stuff for people to have and know. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Andy. And we want to acknowledge to those in the chat, there was a lot of questions coming through and we've tried our hardest to, to note them all down so that we can share them and, and present them to Dr. Andy. But if we do miss one, please don't be offended. It's just simply we were overwhelmed by a few things coming through. But uh, yeah, we have a lot here, Eric, don't we? Yeah, go ahead and start off. Well, um, many of them you, you did touch on in various parts of the presentation, but um, uh, out of respect to those that have posed the questions, I'd still like to put them to you and perhaps... Sure. Thank you. So uh, urgent care physicians uh, at higher risk, you know, such as ones, doctors, nurses, I know you covered that. And if so, do they have access to mental health resources in the same way that other uh, first responders might, such as police officers and firefighters? Um, I think they have um, access but there's a problem, and that's why I would encourage people to read the New York Times article on Lorna Breen, because a lot of physicians are afraid to access care because, and, and nurses because they're afraid of um, having to answer questions on licensing um, applications. Um, and uh, the family of Lorna Breen has uh, initiated all sorts of legislative activities trying to to help uh, physicians feel safe accessing care, that if they access care, it won't hurt them professionally. One of the things that appears to have uh, driven uh, Dr. Breen to suicide was uh, she had gotten very depressed. Uh, she'd gotten suicidal. She had sought care. And she became very concerned that the record of her care would impact her um, her profession, her uh, ability to do her job. And I think people tried to reassure her that that wasn't the case, but I think she was worried and there's some grain of truth. And they've, uh, they've created the Lorna Breen Foundation. And, uh, but I think there's care available, but the question is whether people will access it. And I think a lot of, and, and as I said, Lorna Breen's case illustrates where very competent, very good physicians, very smart, you know, hesitate and at a great cost. Thank you. Just for some uh, clarification, it sounds like a lot of these professions, nurses, um, physicians and such, um, the, the main point you made was about they become desensitized. Um, is that something in the mental health uh, uh, world, like the, the professionals, are they aware of that? And do they have um, ways to treat or manage uh, uh, this desensitization, desensitization issue? Um, not that I know of. Um, and and here's, the, here's the problem, is that the uh, Thomas Joyner, who has researched this the most, um, he thinks, unfortunately, once you achieve the capacity, it's static. Um, in other words, once, once you have that capacity, it doesn't go away. 
Um, and that may help explain why veterans, even older veterans, are still at risk. Um, and I think at least, um, I think education helps. I mean, with my patients, I, I try to talk to them about, you know, you, you might be at risk because you've got the acquired capacity. Um, and it, it, but in terms of changing it, I don't know of any research that shows that once you've got the capacity, uh, it can change. Um, obviously, our hope is that you can change people's psychology around aloneness and burdensomeness. And, um, but unfortunately, the acquired capacity for lethal self-harm may be static. So on that point, then, there was a question that asked that pre presenting a greater sense of purpose to somebody's life, does that help to negate the capacity if somebody suddenly becomes a, a father or a mother, or if somebody suddenly has a worthwhile cause that they're committed to, such as even faith or whatever it might be, does that help take away the capacity for some people? Well, I think, I don't think it takes it away. I think it offsets it. Yeah, I, I, I look for ways of, uh, in my patients, uh, of, of trying to help them find meaning and purpose and, and, um, and, and also um, the misperception of burdensomeness. Um, one of the things that I, I don't think we understand is like, and I, and I think the Kay Jamison quote illustrates it beautifully. I mean, it, when Kay Jamison was suicidal, she had the world in her hands. I mean, she was an outstanding graduate student. She was smart. Um, you know, you, you would not have predicted. But what it, it's, whatever it is that leads to this sense of burdensomeness, I think that's the greatest risk. And, and what I work with my patients on is if somebody feels like they are a burden and their family would be better off without them, I will ask them, okay, well, but if you die, how will your mother react? And if they say to me, I know my mother would be devastated and that's what keeps me alive, I breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief. But if they say, my mother will get over it, you know, you know she'll be upset for a while, but um, she'll get over it, then my alarm bells go off. Because if, if they're absolutely convinced they're a burden, and um, I don't think we understand the triggers for that completely. I mean, obviously, I mean, if I lose my job, I'm gonna feel lousy. But what is it that leads me to dip to a place where I feel like my family would be better off if I was dead? And, and I think that descent into absolute conviction of burdensomeness is an unknown. And, and I think that, that's where I direct a lot of my attention with my patients. Right, we've got another question here. Um, uh, you did kind of bring up how uh, the act of suicide most likely is not, uh, in most cases, not a cowardly act. Um, when we are in conversation with people and they kind of have that view, um, what are some of the things that we can maybe uh, uh, express to them or say to them that would um, might change their mind or might uh, get them to think in a different way? That, that the uh, act of suicide isn't necessarily selfish or cowardly. Well, I think... I, I think you can be more absolute, Eric. Um, okay. I, I, think, I, I think you can say, look, you may think this, other people may think this. This is not weakness. This is not weakness. It is very hard to kill yourself. And the fact that you're close to it tells us how much pain you are in. You are in so much pain that you're seriously contemplating ending your life. Um, and, and I don't want you to feel ashamed and think that somehow you're being cowardly because that's just compounding the misery here. Um, this is a, this is a oh, fearsome, a difficult thing to do. You're thinking about doing it. We've got to unpack the reasons. But if, if there's anything in your mind right now where you feel like you're being weak or cowardly, I want to do everything right now in this moment to dispel that notion. Um, I, I, we want to get that out of the picture because the fact that you're feeling suicidal means you are in such pain that you want to end your life. And we've got to go after the source of that pain. 
you know, and, and, very good. Uh, and, I, and I think it's just, it's real important that um, to step back from it for a moment. I think anytime you hear somebody say, well, you know, they just bailed out, they were weak, they were cowardly, they killed themselves because they couldn't face the music. I think you very politely want to say to somebody, no. There's nothing cowardly. It is a very difficult thing to do. They must have been in extraordinary pain. They must have felt utterly hopeless. They must have felt like um, people would be better off if they were dead. That's a terrible thing to feel. So you're really encouraging empathy to put ourselves in, attempt to put ourselves in their position. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and it's, but I, yes, it's empathy, but I think it's also what's important it is, I think, what the science shows us. The people who have studied this, I think, show us that it, it, yes, it's empathy, but it's also a statement of what I would regard as the truth. Right. That, I mean, if somebody's seriously thinking about killing themselves, they are in serious pain. Now, they may want to, you know, feel ashamed of the pain or try to keep up appearances or think that it's not reasonable for them to feel that much pain, but, but they're in pain. They're in unbearable pain. And it, it feels like, you know, the only choice, it, it feels like they're on top of the World Trade Center. And if they don't kill themselves, they're going to be burned up. I mean, the pain is that bad. Right. So are there, there's a joint question here. Are there things that we should not say or do? And are there things that we should say and do? You've already touched on some of those, but if we um, suspect somebody. I, I, think, I think the only sort of, absolute um, no-no is um, the one that I had in the slide, which is, you, you don't want to say, well, do you feel like you've got the courage to kill yourself? Because right. that, implies, that implies weakness. But I, I, I don't think there's, there's that, that's the only one that I would say is a no-no. Um, I, I think, the, I think the, the, the essence of this talk is that I, I think too many people go after um, are you having suicidal thoughts? Are you having suicidal plans? Are you uh, thinking about killing yourself? I, I think you want to. I, I, I think you want to talk to people. Are they feeling alone? Are they feeling lonely? Um, are they feeling unconnected oh. to people? Um, um, because some people, in effect, are suicidal and they don't yet know it. Um, are you? Are you? Do you? Do you feel like, do you feel, do you feel connected to anybody? Do you, do you feel like um, you're, you're connected to anybody? Okay, you feel kind of isolated. Is there anybody that relies on you? Is there anybody connected mm. to you and depends on you? I mean, you want to find out about aloneness and loneliness, and you want to find out about feelings of hopelessness that that'll ever change. Mm -hmm. do, do you feel like you're always going to be alone now that you're, uh, wife has died. Do you feel like you're never going to find somebody? You're always going to be alone. So you you ask about aloneness and you ask about burdensomeness in the sense of, do you feel like people would be better off if you were gone? Do you feel like people would be unburdened? Um, do you feel like you're a drag on your friends, on your family? Do you feel like they'd be better off if you just disappeared into the hills? You want to assay aloneness and burdensomeness because my argument here is you're, you're going to the, the issues that are generating if they do have suicidal plans. And the other thing, too, is that people don't expect it. Most people going to a mental health professional expect somebody sitting there with a checklist saying, are you feeling suicidal? Are you having plans? You know, are you having impulses? And I think you, you can get a more accurate assay of the risk factors if you focus on aloneness, burdensomeness hopelessness that that'll ever change. And then think about, you know, capacity. If you know the person is a veteran, you know they got capacity. If they're a physician, they got capacity. If they're a nurse, they've got capacity. If they're a homeless person, they've got capacity. If they're an ex-alcoholic, they've got capacity. You don't necessarily need to ask them a lot of questions about that. Got it. So I like that. So focusing less on uh, the direct, like, hey, are you having suicidal thoughts? And more yeah. um, going um, to the root of, like, are, are you feeling alone? Are you feeling like you're a burden on society? I, I can I can understand that. Yeah, I mean that. I, I think you're you're 
you're, you're more likely to pick up on. And, and also if somebody, mm -hmm. the other thing too, is that there's a self preservative instinct, I think. And, and if, if somebody is suicidal and they're trying to hide it from you, they got to work to hide it from you. Okay. And they're expecting you, you to ask them, are you having suicidal plans? And they can say no, when they've got a plan in their head. Um, whereas if you ask about aloneness and burdensomeness, it's, it's, it's hard work to hide that. And, and you're more likely to get it leaking out. That, I'm yeah. glad you highlighted that because one of the questions we had was um, what are some of the best ways to help someone who we feel may be suicidal but won't admit it either to themselves or to you. But by yeah. delving into those foundations, you can help. Right. And you can say to somebody, look, it, you, you know, you're feeling pretty alone and lonely and that's not good. And you're feeling like people would be better off without you. That's a part of human nature that makes you at risk for suicide. Mm. I think you're probably pretty depressed. Let's get you some help before that sense of aloneness and burdensomeness starts to generate suicidal feelings. Maybe you've already had them, but the, mm. the suicidal feelings are sort of secondary. The, the point of this talk, one of the points is that we're trying to move closer to the, the, the core that's generating the, the risk. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that's, yeah. And, and I, if you step back and you look at, you know, all of the risk factors for suicide, unemployment, divorce, um, drug abuse, all these things, those are all statistically known probabilistic associations with suicide. My argument is that's all fine and good, but they're distal. If you look at all those things, every one of them maps onto ABC in my mm -hmm. argument. Now we talked a lot about um, identifying uh, when someone is um, going through this, these thoughts, but what, what do we do to help them? What, what uh, you know, I, 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 I hearing a lot about like listening or calling a hotline or, um, now, now that we know how to do it, or uh, what do we do after that? Well, it's, 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 look, it's, it's really difficult. I think it's going to be the individual situation, your individual relationship. Um, I think you have to, as I said, I think you have to trust your gut. If somebody's denying it, but you're worried about it, listen to your worry and say, look, um, you, you're not going home tonight. You're staying here with Dorothy and me. You know, I'm just not leaving you at home tonight. We got a bedroom. You're staying here. And, and tomorrow morning, we're oh, going we're, we're gonna to call your primary care physician. We're going to get you some help. Or I know you haven't felt very good about your therapist, but I'm going to call your therapist. You know, I'm just worried about you. And, I, and, and I, you may be having suicidal thoughts. I don't know. But you're just really alone and depressed. And you're talking about, you know, you know. People would be better off if I just faded away. That, that's, a, that's, you know, we're just not going to go along with that. So actually the, shining a light on it, um, sort yeah. of calling out the elephant in the room can help. Yeah. Yeah. You want to call out the room and, and, and you can say to somebody, a lot of people are afraid, well, what if I'm wrong? What, what's, so you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what's the, there's an asymmetry of risk here. So you're wrong. They're not as depressed as you thought. Okay, they're going to live, but yeah. if they if they are as depressed as you thought, and they've been trying to hide it, and they've been on the verge of suicide, hmm. you know, you save them. They'll appreciate and, it. Yeah, and and you know, so so you so you guess wrong. It, the intent, the the, but even if you guess wrong, you're communicating that you care about that person mm -hmm. and you don't want to lose them. So there, you know, th there's no loss in a sense. You've conveyed their 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 worth to you. You want them to stay alive. They're valuable to you. Yeah. One of the things that I've heard um, uh, and have tried uh, with some folks who were suicidal was making plans for the future. Um, uh, and I would like to hear like what your opinion is. For example, hey. Um, can I come see you next uh, next Thursday? Uh, hey, let's go out to lunch tomorrow, uh, and sort of having them potentially commit to um, something to do in the future. 
uh, something to look forward to. What were your thoughts? Um, yes, I think if you can do that, that's potentially useful. But the problem you have is some people have already made the decision. I'm going to kill myself on March 15th and I've decided on it. I'll gladly go to lunch with you on March 1st. <laughs> you know, yeah. we'll have yeah. a good time. And, and, and because they've made the decision, they may be somewhat relieved, but it's still there. If they've decided to kill themselves, somebody's out to murder them and part of them is going to react. And, and you, you just hope you pick up on it. And, and that's what's beautiful about the, about the beautiful is a terrible word to use, but it's beautiful in that it illustrates it. If you look at that, if you look at that tape of, I think her name was Javodi, she's trying to put forth that she's completely at peace with the decision to kill herself. This is the right thing to do. She's completely at peace. And, and it just, it just, she can't contain it. And her blink rate is down and her affect gets stressed. And she's trying to maintain this um, false front that she's, you know, completely at peace with it. And if somebody's decided to kill themselves on March 15th and they go to lunch with you on March 1st, if you sit long enough with them and you start to feel uncomfortable, you can start asking them questions and it may, you, mm -hmm. you know, they may not be able to hide it. And then you can say, let's go, come on, we're going to go get some help. So on you, that, no, you, you, let me just finish. You, you, you've, you have to keep in mind that this is really difficult. We, we, we're not good at predicting suicide. My profession is terrible at predicting suicide, a little better than chance. It's really, really hard. And, and that's why I think it's important for, um, you know, it, it's friends and family that are likely to pick up on it before me. So that ties in well then, Dr. Andy, with, you've given us a lot of, none of us are trained therapists in the same way that you are, but you've given us things to look out for, warning signs, blink rate, things like that. What if somebody refuses to or is unwilling to gain help and they do follow through? What suggestions do you give for those who perhaps were left there feeling helpless that they tried or either missed the signs or read the signs, but the person still went through with what they wanted to do? Well, um, I think you know, to get some therapy themselves, because I think any mm -hmm. therapist worth their, you know, you know, worth anything is going to work with them about it's, you know, we can't as a mental health professional make accurate predictions. How are you going to? And you tried, you, you tried, you know, and, 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 and you made from what you tell me, every best effort to try to help them. And, and sometimes tragically we lose, but you tried and you've got to give yourself credit for that. But there will be for a while, the terrible, oh, I should have picked up on it. I missed the signs. I saw the signs, but I didn't move aggressively enough. We, we don't want to admit powerlessness. I mean, the human mind hates yeah. powerlessness. Yeah. That's why all of us, that's why all of us say it's raining today because I didn't bring my umbrella. Because <laughs> we don't want to admit that we got no control over the weather. Yeah. And and we don't have control over people's suicidality. We can we can try to save them, but a lot of people are just, you know, determined. And but but I but I, I want to go back to something that you first said. I want I want to back up for a second. You said, well, you all aren't therapists. Okay, that may be true. But I trained as a therapist and basically what I learned was what I think most women know intuitively. Okay. And so I don't think you want to minimize if you're connected to somebody, you're going to, you're going to pick up on it long before I would, you know, the person and, and know the person. Well, you'll pick up on it. You're probably going to do a better job at predicting it and picking up on it than if the person came into my office and I saw them for the first time not knowing them. And I, and I deployed all my questions. I, I would submit to you that if you know the person well and, and you'll pick, you, you will start picking up on stuff. And the idea here is to give you some tools that when you do start picking up on it, 
you can ask some questions that'll help you assess risk. Thank you. We've got time for about two. We got a lot of questions here, but we really have time for about two more. Uh, the next question is, um, as a parent of two adopted children who've been both who, who both of these children have been hospitalized more than once for suicidal ide ideation, um, I'm becoming desensitized to it. And that's uh, concerning me. What can I do? Uh, and Or is this okay? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I, I think that's a, look, that's a very difficult situation to be in as a parent. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I think... Um, I, it's understandable you'd get desensitized to it because you you can't call out five alarms all the time. Um, I think you know just I guess trying to pay as close attention as possible to the, the core things that you think would put one of the children at risk. But uh, that's mm -hmm. a um, my heart goes out to you. That's a it's a terrible situation for parents to be in. I think the ABCs might assist in some of this, uh, might too. Well, um, yeah, I mean, our children, children will feel very alone and they will feel like it will never end. They will always be alone. Mm. Children can feel like the family will be better off if they're gone. Um, and um, it, it's a hard thing to counter. Um, children have very short time horizons in their head. They, they, they can't imagine adult life. Um, and I think, again, trying to address or find out if they're feeling alone and lonely and hopeless that it will never change. If they're feeling like they're a burden to the family, they're a drain on resources, they're, it's, you know, no point investing anything further in me. And that'll always be the case. Um, I think those are important things to try to assay. Yeah. Um, one final one if, or that I would love to share, um, particularly pertains to us here at Recovering From Religion. We're often helping people who have been ostracized from a community because they've perhaps left their faith. So they're feeling extremely vulnerable. Um, and many people who come to RFR have literally lost family connections, friends, social circles. So they, they're at a greater risk. Um, how, how would you recommend we can all help as peers to build self-esteem, self-worth, and a sense of optimism and hope for the future? Um, I can't thank you enough for that question. I meant to talk about that, but I was I just trying to get too much in. I think it is absolutely crucial that people uh, be aware of that. Um, I live near Jerry Falwell's empire, and I see the, the fallout from um, Thomas Road Baptist Church and, um, and those families. And uh, I think anybody involved with people who leave religion have to be aware that um, people are often completely shunned by their families. They lose their families. They, they, are, they, they lose their, their safety net. They, they're out in the cold alone. And it's devastating. And, and I, I don't know if anybody has studied this, but um, they're, I just, I'm, I'm curious what other people think. Uh, and, you know, Daryl has seen far more of it than I, um, but I think people who uh, leave religion are at risk for being depressed. I think if they've lost everybody, they're at risk for feeling suicidal. Um, I think it's a huge thing. And in terms of how to deal with it is talking to people, particularly if you hear of somebody who's lost all their connections, you know, lost all their friends and family, and they're, they're literally in, uh, they've been sent to psychological Siberia, I think to talk to them openly about you're at risk for getting depressed, you may be at risk at times for feeling suicidal or feeling like it's pointless to live. Um, and we're just going to get that out on the table right now. You're at risk. And if you start to feel that way, we want to know, we want to help. Got it. 
Dr. Thompson, thank you so much for being here again. Um, before well, we no, wrap thank up, you for having me and, and yeah. putting up with 100 slides. <laughs> do this every time, and I don't know how you do it, but you do it, my friend. I try, I, try to, I, try, I try to shorten it each time. I know you don't, it, it doesn't seem that way. It's no, brilliant. it was a fantastic presentation and so many comments coming through of appreciation from those who are watching it live. Thank you. Yeah. No, thanks for having me. Uh, you guys are wonderful. I've been wanting to have this discussion for a really long time and I couldn't think of anyone, anybody more perfect to do it than you. Before we um, uh, kind of move on to the wrapping up, do you have any final thoughts that you want to close with? Anything that we uh, hadn't touched on or talked about? No, I just, again, I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to get this information across. Um, and I, I appreciate the work that you all do. And um, yeah, just thank you from the bottom of my heart. Yeah, awesome. Folks, uh, this has been, like I said at the beginning, a fantastic RFRX. And uh, thank you so much for sticking around and uh, being here and joining with us, uh, joining us today. Um, you might think, how the heck can we top this? Well, we've got another one coming next week. Same bad time, same bad place. And it is uh, Leaving God, a film by filmmaker John Follis. He's going to be on. We're going to be talking with him about the, the film, kind of uh, answering your questions once you watch it. So here's the kind of the description. The largest and fastest growing religion in the U.S. isn't a religion. It's the absence of one. In this RFRX, we sit down and talk with the writer and director of the award-winning documentary, Leaving God. This film explores a major cultural shift away from religion and God happening in today's America and how this shift contributed to the filmmaker's own journey and changing beliefs. Um, and folks, the evening before, so we have RFRX on Monday night. So on Sunday night, next Sunday night, we will be screening this film and uh, go ahead and look for it in everywhere you found this RFRX, but we're gonna be screening this film and John will join us for a bit of a Q and A. It's not gonna be recorded, but uh, come back on Monday night and we'll talk more about it. So, uh, Sasha, what's next? Thank you. So a few people are asking how they can access this presentation um, or any of our previous ones. Within a couple of weeks, give us a little bit of time just to upload that. It will be available on our YouTube channel, so please feel free to check it out. So just Recovering from Religion on YouTube, you can find this presentation and the fantastic back catalogue of other presentations that we've done over the years as well. Um, if you have any questions, comments, inquiries, anything like that, please feel free to send it through to us via our email, which is rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org, or you can drop it in the chat using the chat feature on the front page of Recovering From Religion and market attention to the RFRX team. Um, find our blog, our podcast. We really encourage you to have a look at all of our different socials, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and please feel free to share the content with people that you feel may appreciate it or enjoy it. Um, we, we really appreciate getting, getting the word out there, spreading the word, so to speak. You know, and we also have a newsletter, folks. Um, if you're interested in um, seeing what's coming up with RFR News, um, published videos, uh, uh, podcasts, um, even on our blog, our excommunications blog, which is fantastic, uh, recent articles um, that have been posted that may interest you, take a look at our blog. All right. With that being said, um, I'm going to, at the end of every RFRX, I want to hear from you. I want to kind of hear what your thoughts are. That kind of helps us uh, with future programming. And so I've got an exit poll, a, a feedback poll. And while that poll is going, I'm going to bring on someone very, very special, the founder and president of Recovering from Religion, Dr. Dale Ray. Dr. Ray, welcome. Thanks, Eric. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Great. Good, good. Okay. Uh, Dr. Thompson, thank you. This has been an education for me. Uh, wow. You, that's a lot of information to absorb. I'm going to have to go back and rewatch this, I think. Uh, and I, as I was going, I kept going through this, I kept thinking, damn, our volunteers, everyone needs to watch what you've told us tonight. Because there are times on our chats that I think our volunteers could ask those questions and it would really help, um, help them frame what they need to be doing. We're not a suicide hotline, obviously, but we do deal with people who are who, who are suicidal. So 
Uh, I think these are great concepts. I love the ABC thing. It's so simple. It's easy to, to grab onto. So uh, I just can't thank you enough for coming back again and, uh, and educating us. Our, uh, I am happy to say that we've done- a, Well, again, a thank good, you very much for having me. Great. I think we have, uh, in our training program for volunteers, we train them to not be afraid to talk openly about it, to be direct about it. Don't pussyfoot around. If you're, if you suspect one of our clients is uh, suicidal, be direct about it. And uh, so this information will help them be even more direct or, or help them not be direct, help them assess even better. So I, I think some good tools here that we, we should probably include into our training. Uh, I want to say to anybody's listening here, if this has had, if this caused any concern or disturbance for you, I hope you'll find somebody to talk to, reach out, um, explore, explore that concern with a therapist, uh, chat in with us if you, if you uh, need to, but uh, make sure you take care of yourself. This has been a tough topic and uh, we want everyone to, to, to be safe in their own skin for sure. All right, well, on a happier note, uh, we had a fundraiser for the last month and we have worked our butts off. Our uh, fearless uh, leaders of the, of the fundraising campaign have uh, knocked themselves out and just done incredibly good work. And so I'm happy to report tonight that we have semi-final numbers. Uh, I know a number of you have donated and uh, some of you even worked on the, on the fundraising team. But I want to give you the, the preliminary numbers. We think there's more money coming in, or we're pretty sure there is, in fact. But at this point, we had a $10,000 goal. And we have so far made, right on the money, $11,500. Wow. So we exceeded our goal. Wow. But here's the, here's the cool thing. Our basic goal was $10,000. And we were, we were using that money to help subsidize um, the, uh, uh, the excursion. And we said any money over that we are going to be using for, uh, and this is still under study, but we're going to be using for a billboard. It looks like we've got the funds to actually do a billboard. We're not sure where or when we're going to do it. <laughs> but if you are a volunteer for you come from religion, be sure and go into your Slack channel there's a special announcement about those billboards and only volunteers are allowed to see it. <laughs> so, sorry, if you're not a volunteer, you don't get in there. Uh, what we've done is we actually ask all our volunteers to give us ideas for billboards a couple of weeks ago and they gave us great ideas. And from those, all that stuff, we, we boiled it down to six ideas for billboards and our web person, Shannon Nebo has put beautiful billboard kind of mock-ups together and we're asking all of our volunteers to go in and uh, prioritize rank rank order them choosing the top three so we're damn serious about this billboard idea and we're pretty sure <laughs> somebody suggested we should put the or recover from religion billboard uh near uh, in the city with the most hellfire and brimstone uh billboards <laughs> so i don't know what we'll do there but that would that might be a good idea so uh, also, I want to everybody, uh, Ethan Michael ran our fundraiser last year, and he did it again this year. And both years, he's done a wonderful job, brought all sorts of people in. It was just like a who's who of YouTubers all through his four and almost four and a half hours of, of fundraising last Saturday. So I would ask all of you to go to um, your friendly neighborhood atheist. And go and tell him thank you for being such a great um, ally and supporter of Recovery from Religion. And subscribe to his YouTube channel. I mean, he's not, he doesn't make a dime out of this. He doesn't gain anything out of it. And I'll guarantee you put a hell of a lot of work into it. Uh, hours, uh, we've been planning this for three months and he's been involved since the very first day. So we really owe him a great, great debt of gratitude. And as I've told him and many people involved in the fundraiser, Money was one of our two objects. The other objective was to get the word out about our services and let people know we exist and we're here to help. And we saw a real uptick in clients calling in and chatting in during, uh, during this whole time. And another beautiful thing is we've had an uptick in volunteers. 
Um, we've even got some volunteers in areas that we've been needing some help in, like in IT, which is excellent. So anyway, that is all I have for tonight. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Well, folks, that's going to wrap up another episode of RFRX. It's in the bag. We're getting so close to 100. I can smell it. Or maybe that's my sweaty armpits. I don't know. Thanks, everyone, for helping out this today. Sasha, thank you so much for um, co-hosting with me. I really, really appreciate it.